when people come here, and this is, I partially asked you this, what precautions do you take when, you, when, when people come here um, and is there some sort of ID system that you have for, for people coming in and out? When you say precautions, as far well, we talked about background background checks. So, what what rules? Uh, part of that is what rules okay. have to be followed here. Okay. Well, and is there an ID system? Okay. Well, I think it's really important that people know there's a curfew here. So, if you're staying with us, you know you're in the door by ten o'clock. So we don't have people at eleven or twelve o'clock out in Hackensack or you know causing mischief. That's the, those are not our individuals. They do have a curfew. They do have to be here. They can also be here all day long. They don't have to be out in the environs. They, you know, they don't need to be. Um, as far as precautions, I think one of the most important things that we do, and we actually just had the governor's office that was up here on Friday learning about our assessment tool because it really is um, a best practice. We assess people the minute they come in. Very quickly, we can determine if they are not stable, if they need to be hospitalized. We can also determine through our nurse if they need medical assistance. So this team approach is the minute that someone comes in, if we have any concerns at all about that, we can address that quickly. What if somebody breaks curfew? What's the consequence for that? Okay. If a person breaks curfew, they are notified that it most likely will result in them losing any opportunity for extensions. So it will cut down on the amount of time that they can stay with us. That's one of the criteria for staying with us is being in the bed every single night. If it were to happen more than one time, then I would sit down and meet with them and find out the reasons that they're missing curfew. We really feel that if you have someplace else to be, then you should be somewhere else. But most of our people really need to be here, so the curfew issue really has not been a significant problem for us. Okay, well, what is cause to, is there any cause to not be able to stay here or to get kicked out of here? We have house rules. If you are violating a house rule, then you may be asked to leave. If anyone was found in the, in, in the building using illicit substances on the property of a county building, they would be discharged. We're not able to allow for any kind of behavior like that. If you um, were to injure someone else, if there's any kind of violence um, on the property against another individual, um, even threats of violence, that may be a cons consideration for discharge. It really is a case by case. You really need to look at, you know, is this person really need um, an intervention right now? Do they need to go to the hospital? Do they need a program? For some people, we may say, in order for you to stay, you need to do, you know, you need to follow this, this part of your care plan to continue to stay here. The important thing to know is that, you know, I'm someone with 25 years of experience. I know every client that's in this program right now. If there's anything going on, if there's any concerns of the staff, I oversee all of that. And I will sit down with that individual and I can make that determination and it is my responsibility to make sure that that person's not a risk to themselves, not a risk to others, and certainly not a risk to the community. Okay, something else that's said in the community is that this place is too nice. There's no motivation for anybody to even want to get out of here. Okay. Uh, and that there are people coming here from all over the place just okay. because that this place is known far and wide okay. uh, as being a place that's nice to stay and people come here. So please respond to that. One of the things that we do when a person first comes in is we establish where their, um, their last place that they lived is. So if, if you say the person comes in, they just say they're from Hackensack or they say they're from another place, we check that out. We call the Board of, Surface, Board of Social Services and we do a little background to make sure that they are indeed from the county. Being that it is probably the nicest shelter probably in the, in the country. Um, we have rules in place to make sure that people understand that this is not a permanent place. Number one, the minute they come in, we're talking about discharge. We design that plan and where they're going to go. Again, we're 90 days, so they're told at the onset you know, that you really can't stay very long here. People are not to put anything on the walls. They're allowed to keep limited things. They get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, even on Sundays. There's curfews. We make sure that people understand that there is an expectation. They can't be sleeping in their bed all day. There's no televisions on during the day. They really are expected to be working on getting a job or getting an apartment or addressing their medical concerns while they're here. There really is no, there's a lot of pressure for people to understand that this is really the place to get their lives back together. It's not a hangout. It's not a place that is going to be where you're going to live for the rest of your life. 
what percentage of the people that uh, go through here get a job? That's, I don't have the statistic off the top of my head. I would imagine it's somewhere between 15 to 20 percent. And some people do that completely on their own. And some people do that once they move out. You know, once they're stable, they have their apartments and they're able to find employment. Many people, you know, also with the recession, the face of homelessness has changed. When we opened in 2009, the predominantly what we were working with were the people that the community was concerned about the people that were walking the streets and sleeping on, you know, on benches. And you don't really see that as much as you used to because we've addressed that, that group. Many folks that are coming in now come in because of the recession, come in because that even though they're working, their hours have been cut back or their wages have cut back, and they find that they just can't make ends meet. So we do have individuals here that you know, are currently working or were just working. So I don't want it to be perceived that, you know, all 90 people here um, are, are unemployed because that's just simply not true. Okay, um, in, a, in any uh, given year, how many meals do you, do you save, or the most, the most recent year that you have the number for? How many meals do you serve and how many people actually uh, uh, stayed here? Um, we do about 70,000 meals a year and that's all the meals. If you consider that um, most of those people are residents that have been, you know, people, guests, shelter guests that are staying here, um, we do about 150 meals a night. So we estimate that about 25 to 35 of those people are from the community. And the rest are people that are staying here in shelter. And it's usually people that find themselves towards the end of the month they're struggling a little bit, and then they're coming in because our numbers rise towards the end of the month um, and decrease in the beginning of the month. So that tells us that you know people are just having trouble making ends meet towards the end of the month. Are a lot of people who are staying here are they getting say like social security disability or uh, what is do they have any assistance that's coming in? One of the one of the interesting things about the center is when we opened, about 50 percent of the homeless individuals were getting benefits. Because of the center and the one stop and the collaboration and having the Board of Social Services on site, having all these services on site, now 90% of these individuals are, are getting benefits. Um, most of them are food stamps. Some people are getting general assistance through the Board of Social Services. Social Security is more challenging. Um, we've had a number of individuals here trained to do the SOAR initiative because we believe that if people have their um, their SSI or SSD in place, then you know we can help them along. Certainly, they'll be able to afford um, at least a single room in the community, and that's really important to us is to get those benefits, especially for people that are disabled. But that's uh, become increasingly challenging. What we have here too is we have lawyers that are here from the Northern New Jersey Legal Services. They're here once a week. They help those individuals that are denied benefits to you know they advocate for them to make sure that you know that's something that they can work on. And what is your annual budget? My annual budget for the center mm -hmm. or my... For the, to run the center and all the services you provide? i rather not release that. I, I would need to ask the county to release that. Okay. To okay, be honest with public, you. Public. No, no, I, I, I know, but I think it's... I, can I give that to you? Yes. Okay. If you had an opportunity to say something to the residents, particularly of this ward here in this area, about what this is all about and how it impacts them. So a lot of them are very upset. Um, what would be your message to them? My message to them is for the past four years that we've been here, we've decreased homelessness by 35%. We've done that. And I think it's important for people to understand that someone may look uh, stereotypically homeless. It doesn't mean that they're homeless. One of the things we've done with the Hackensack Outreach Collaboration that I started working with the Upper Main Alliance and the other providers, is to really um, educate the community about what homeless looks like, what homeless is, um, and also to really understand um, a humane way to work with people. Because when homeless individuals are put back into housing, they're safer, the community's safer. And I also believe that there are a lot of things that plague Hackensack right now. I think it's unfair to vilify a homeless individual. I think for most of them, they're just trying to get by. They're trying to, they're trying to get a meal. They're trying to um, get back into housing or get a job, and they're just struggling. And so my message would be 
to allow us to do our job. We have a very good handle on who our people are. We work very well with the police. We work very well with Upper Main Alliance. We work very well with uh, all of our, um, our businesses in the area. I check in with them regularly. We're very responsive. If the community has a question or a concern, we will go out. We are responsive. We'll go and check it out and see whatever it is that we can do. Um, and I'm welcome, you know, I, I welcome the opportunity to address this if I need to, you know, with the council. I have gone out to the community watch meetings and I have addressed this. I addressed this when I first came. And again, I think the message is really understanding that the folks that we're working with here that were at, are m mainly Hackensack. I mean, we have a lot of folks from Hackensack that are coming in for services and in addition to ending homelessness for 35% since 2010, we also have prevented homelessness for hundreds of families and hundreds of individuals through our HPRP program. So those are folks um, that also from Hackensack that would be homeless if not for the center and if not for what we're providing here. How do you base that number on 35%? Because we actually have the point in time surveys that were completed. And I can certainly share those with you. Those are, those are done every year. The point in time surveys is one time a year. We go out into the community and we count the homeless. And so we've been evaluating and looking at our numbers each year that we've been here. And each year that we've been here, um, the first year dropped 12%, then 24, now 35. How do you uh, know someone's homeless? Uh, how, do you, how does somebody get categorized, put in that category as homeless? Because you say that well, just because somebody looks homeless mm -hmm. doesn't mean they are, and people shouldn't assume. Well, right. how do you know? Well, when they come in, again, we have an assessment process that we can look into that. We can look into um, if they say that they've lived in an address, they have, to present, um, they have to present proof that they lived at that address with the Board of Social Services. So we depend on the Board of Social Services to tell us whether or not somebody was living in the community, um, and was in that location where they identified. So the burden of proof is really, really has been on them, and they're a partner for us, and we work with them. Um, you can't just if a person simply comes in and they're saying that I'm homeless, if they're like I said, if they're out of state, they're out of county. Again, we will do the humane thing. We will help them. We will address their immediate needs for several days, but then we're going to help them return back to where they they. You, you can't just decide to relocate here. From another, from another county or another state, there's penalties that go on with the Board of Social Services that we have nothing to do with. Yeah, but, but as far as your survey, that you say you go out the point to, in time. to count the homeless. Yes. Uh, how, how do you determine that someone's homeless? Is it because they tell you they're homeless? or? What's okay, the, you're speaking specifically at the point in time. The 35%. Okay, so the point in time, they're coming in here, they're talking to people in any shelter, whether it's a domestic violence shelter, it's this shelter, it's the family shelter. So they're talking to sheltered individuals. They're out at 4 o'clock in the morning, they're out, you know, looking for places where homeless people normally would be. They would look under a bridge, they would look in the parks. So they're actually out in the street. So if you are sleeping out on the street and it's 4 o'clock in the morning, there is a chance that you are a homeless individual. They do approach the individual, they do an interview with them, and they ask them questions. And most people are cooperative and most people do answer those questions. So that point in time survey is really recognized throughout our system as, uh, as a good tool of really identifying, are you making an impact? We here in Bergen County have made such an impact that we have people coming up from all over the state um, to look at what we're doing, to look at our model. I myself sit on the Governor's Interagency Council. They're looking at Bergen County as really a best practice model, especially for our assessment process, our rapid assessment, which I think is the question that you're asking me is how do we know? It's in that rapid assessment piece that we're able to piece together the puzzle that the person comes in with and quickly determine what they need to do. Okay. What is your relationship with the police department in terms of their quality of life initiative, which is heavily focused on the homeless mm -hmm. and, and crimes committed by, by the homeless, which according to the police department is a significant percentage. Um, what is your relationship, your working relationship with the police department and do you, if you find someone with a criminal background, do you, do you call the police department, do you refer people, uh, what is your communication okay. with them? Um, I've always had a very excellent relationship with the police, um, county police, with the sheriff's office, and with Hackensack. 
This new initiative, the Quality of Life Initiative, I have met with Director Mordega, and my understanding of it from my perspective and what my role is, is to make sure that if there are homeless people out in the streets, out in Hackensack, to ensure that they know about the center and that they can either bring them here or we can do some outreach to them. So I believe that we're both uh, very interested in not criminalizing the mentally ill and making sure that they're really obtaining services that they need. But you say you, you don't want to criminalize the mentally ill, but if they are out there committing crimes, I, I can't speak to whether or not they're, they're committing crimes. If there are individuals here... Well, I'm saying the police mm -hmm. department is saying okay. very clearly okay. that they are committing crimes, that most of them are committing crimes and have extensive criminal records. What I can say to you is if the police come and speak with me, if they're looking for an individual, we cooperate. If there's an individual, they come and they say, you know, we're looking for this person, we have some questions. We certainly do not harbor criminals here. It, we are very cooperative. If they come out, they want to ask them questions. If there's a person that they're looking, a person of interest, if the person does present themselves here at the center, we immediately notify the police, we immediately, whether they're, de they're a detective, whether they're county police, whether they're sheriff we are very cooperative because we don't want people here that are dangerous. We certainly don't want people that are going to endanger the community, but we depend on the police to let us know if there's a person of interest. We, we you know, I have no way to knowing who they're looking for. So I really depend on that communication. And I believe that that communication is very good between us.